So, first of all, a, a note that I grew up going to Boy Scout camp in the Zora Valley. It never occurred to me it was named that because it was small. I don't know if that's the case, but it's fascinating. A reminder of what it seems to me is our usual arrangement, that I am able to teach and preach what I believe. You are free to disagree with me. We live in a culture where not much of this exists. So this is truly amazing evidence of the kingdom of God alive in this place. Second, after last week's sermon, I assume that you have been out looking for angels and offering hospitality to strangers, hoping to entertain angels unaware. That was the lesson from last week's sermon. So I assume you've all been busy as beavers meeting all kinds of strange people, which now that I look across the congregation, you probably could meet right here if you wanted to. Joe. <laughs> Third, after this week, you might be a bit more wary of angels. While they seem to be messengers, only the message, like at Christmas, can be good news, or in this case, it seems really bad news. An angel in scripture is much more than the cherubs we think of on Valentine's Day. Fourth, while this story appears to stand on its own, I really don't think that that was the original intention. This story of Sodom's fall is all tied up with God's conversation with Abraham in the chapter before. You be my people and I will take care of you. You wander off on your own and it can go really really wrong, taking you along with it. Fifth, God makes a promise to Abraham about a son in chapter 18. Abraham has some doubts. Now Sarah has some doubts that lead her to laugh. It's time for a reminder that God keeps his promises. God made clear to Abraham that if Sodom had ten good people in it, it would survive. It didn't. And it didn't. God keeps his promises. Are there any promises that God has made to you that you are wondering about? Upgrade your fire insurance. Six. While the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is horrible and sad, please understand that it is an example in the scripture of what is called intrusion ethics. That is, the judgment seat and the sheep and the goats and the lake of fire all move from the end of time into the presence. A uh, present. We don't have to like it. We don't have to even agree with it. But it would probably be wise to understand it. From God's point of view, Sodom's destruction is already written, whether it takes place today, tomorrow, or some other day, is immaterial. Seventh, Sodom was bad, 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 about as bad as you can get, and I will get to that forthwith. Eighth, I think the Beebs is going to prison. Can you tell I'm not a believer? You guys don't keep up with what's going on in the news, do you? <laughs> you may wonder what that has to do with the story. Nothing really other than poor Justin may discover that prison life is not pleasant. Since the outside reputation of prisons is that is what evil men in Sodom had in mind for the angels. Prison is by its very nature demeaning and disempowering, intended as a place to punish wrongdoers. There's a place that houses wrongdoers. It is not supposed to be warm and cuddly. It can be violent and unforgiving. People can be treated horribly. Prisoners can suffer almost unspeakable things of which one of the worst is rape. Rape, we have learned in recent years, is an act of violence intended to humiliate the person in violence, uh, violated, male or female. With females raped by men, there is the additional mind-numbing potential of the creation of a new human life. One created by the violent perpetrator and the humiliated victim who has also suffered physical, emotional, mental, and even spiritual damage. It is a powerful weapon that while used in prison to humiliate other prisons, it is often used outside prison for the same purposes and terrifyingly it is used as a weapon of mass destruction in warfare. You kill the men, rape the women, and if they don't die from the violence, nine months later they must deal with all that comes 
the new babies created by that violation. When the three visitors came to see Abraham, the Bible says that one of them was the Lord. He had come to visit Sodom and Gomorrah. In chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, we read, The Lord said, Abraham, I have heard that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah are doing all kinds of evil things. Now I am going down to see for myself if those people really are that bad. If they aren't, I want to know about them. As we ended the reading in Genesis 18 last week, the Lord had stayed behind with Abraham as what Genesis tells us in this chapter, angels went on to Sodom. What we didn't read about was Abraham's conversation with the Lord, where Abraham, the Bible's first boy, argued politely with the Lord about how many good persons needed to be in Sodom for it to be saved. Abraham may have assumed that Lot was good, and maybe his wife, and maybe his daughters, and maybe even their husbands, he negotiated the Lord down from 50 to only needing 10 in Sodom. And he may have assumed he knew of six. But I am thinking he was wrong. I assume the Lord already knew how many good people there were in Sodom. And I'm not at all sure he was counting Lot or any of his family. Certainly the story paints a picture of unrepentant violence even while Lot attempts to offer the required hospitality. This story is about unrepentant violence. In particular, violence towards guests and in this very strange occurrence, violence against angels. Scripture says the whole town's number of men came to get the visitors. This place is off the charts horrible. The Bible doesn't explain how Sodom and Gomorrah got there, just that they have, similar to the flood story and Noah, a town, a community, a world that is so bad that change is absolutely necessary. Lot recoils at the idea of turning over his guests to the mob. It is impossible to fulfill the requirements of hospitality and turn away your guests. Yet Lot seems perfectly willing to offer his daughters to them to do as they please, to appease their demand, to humiliate the guests. It is inexplicable. They will have none of it. They intend to humiliate the guests. Let's face it, sex without consent is rape. Always and every time. It is not at all clear that Lot understood his visitors to be angels, even when they blinded the mob so that they can't find Lot or the door to the house. Lot is as spiritually blind as are the people of Sodom, holding only that one shred of decency that the scripture outlines that would not allow him to sacrifice his guests. The rule of hospitality. Turns out that the people of Sodom were as bad as bad can get. Lot's daughters refused to leave the city until the angels pulled them away. Lot's wife turned back after being warned not to, presumably in an act of sympathy or longing for Sodom, and became, of all things, a pillar of salt, a very odd touch, ending her life but making her an invaluable commodity. And those daughters, let's just say that growing up in Sodom had done them no favors in the ethnic departments at all. For a lesson in biblical realism, you can read the rest of the story in chapter 19, but let me assure you, it is not for the faint of heart. Lot and his daughters had reached safety, then all hell broke loose, or as the story tells it, then the Lord sent burning sulfur down like rain on Sodom and Gomorrah. Holocaust. The presence of the holiness of the Lord burns like an everlasting fire, the scripture says. And all that is dross is consumed, wood, hay, stubble burned away, the chaff is thrown into the fire, and all that is left upon the hearth is, uh, the hearth is that which is valuable, or the hearth is bare entirely. When Abraham arose on the next day, he saw that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, that they were not ten good people in that city, and that the Lord had done exactly 
as he had promised. And then, maybe, Abraham recalled another promise. That in a year, he would have a son. A son who would be called Isaac. Whose name sounds like the word to laugh. So now, about those angels, harbingers of God's message, who live to serve the Almighty for all of time, who announce good news, who help some to safety, who gather in the Holy Presence, awaiting the Lord sending, now are you ready to see them? And if so, you will recognize them. Some, by entertaining guests, discover they were entertaining angels, unaware. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which challenges us to think new and deep thoughts, introduces us to your kingdom in new ways, reminds us of things that are precious and things that just aren't. Help us see the difference and know how it is we are to live in your presence. We ask this through the powerful name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord.